This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Following his attorney's advice, Sheeran revealed nothing and respectfully referred Barbara to his counsel. This wasn't the first time Judge Barbara Cranser had written or called the Irishman with the aim of unlocking the secrets in his soul. On March 6, 1995, Barbara had written Frank, It is my personal belief that there are many people who called themselves loyal friends who know what happened to James R. Hoffa, who did it, and why. The fact that not one of them has ever told his family, even under a vow of secrecy, is painful to me. I believe you are one of those people. On October 25, 2001, a week after Barbara's telephone call, Frank the Irishman Sheeran, then in his eighties and using a walker to get around, heard a knock on the patio door of his ground-floor apartment. It was two young FBI agents. They were friendly, relaxed, and very respectful to this man nearing the end of his life. They were hoping he had softened with age, perhaps even repented. They were looking for that deathbed confession. They said they were too young to remember the case, but they had read thousands of pages of the file. They were up front about the recent phone call Sheeran had received from Barbara, telling him straight out they had discussed the call with her. As he had done repeatedly since July 30th, 1975, the day Jimmy disappeared, Sheeran sadly directed the FBI agents to his lawyer, the former district attorney of Philadelphia, F. Emmett Fitzpatrick, Esquire. Failing to persuade Sheeran to cooperate and give a deathbed confession, the FBI announced on April 2, 2002, that it had turned over its complete 16,000-page file to the Michigan District Attorney and had released 1,330 pages of that file to the media and to Jimmy Hoffa's two children. There would be no federal charges. Finally, after nearly 27 years, the FBI had given up. On September 3, 2002, almost a year to the day after James P.'s press conference, the state of Michigan gave up to and closed its file, expressing continued condolences to the Hoffa children. In announcing his decision at a press conference, Michigan District Attorney David Gorsica was quoted as saying, Unfortunately, this has the markings of a great whodunit novel without the final chapter. I Heard You Paint Houses is a whodunit, but it is not a novel. It is a history based on one-on-one -on -one interviews of Frank Sheeran, most of which were tape-recorded. I conducted the first interview in 1991 at Sheeran's apartment, shortly after my partner and I were able to secure Sheeran's premature release from jail on medical grounds. Immediately after that 1991 session, Sheeran had second thoughts about the interrogative nature of the interview process and terminated it. He had admitted far more than he was happy with. I told him to get back in touch with me if he changed his mind and was willing to submit to my questioning. In 1999, Sheeran's daughters arranged a private audience for their aging and physically disabled father with Monsignor Heldefer of St. Dorothy's Church in Philadelphia. Sheeran met with the Monsignor, who granted Sheeran absolution for his sins so that he could be buried in a Catholic cemetery. Frank Sheeran said to me, I believe there is something after we die. If I got a shot at it, I don't want to lose that shot. I don't want to close the door. Following his audience with the Monsignor, Sheeran contacted me, and at Sheeran's request I attended a meeting at his lawyer's office. At the meeting, Sheeran agreed to submit to my questioning, and the interviews began again and continued for four years. I brought to the interview process my experiences as a former homicide and death penalty prosecutor, a lecturer on cross-examination, a student of interrogation, and the author of several articles on the U.S. Supreme Court's exclusionary rule regarding confessions. You're worse than any cop I ever had to deal with, Sheeran said to me once. I spent countless hours just hanging around with the Irishman, meeting alleged mob figures, driving to Detroit to locate the scene of the Hoffa disappearance, driving to Baltimore to find the scene of two underworld deliveries made by Sheeran, meeting with Sheeran's lawyer, and meeting his family and friends, intimately getting to know the man behind the story. 
I spent countless hours on the phone and in person, prodding and picking away at the storehouse of material that formed the basis.